Thank you. I really appreciate um, you all coming today, and I appreciate the Center for International Studies for giving me this opportunity to talk about a topic about which I'm very passionate and that's um, Spanish language news media in the United States. It's my primary area of research as well as coverage of immigration. Um, what I'd like to do today is talk to you a little bit about, well, I always like to dispel the myths about Spanish language news media. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the history, a little bit about the progress, and then I'd like to end up um, showing you some real examples of how Spanish language news media coverage is different than general market news media coverage on one key issue, and that's immigration. Um, the title of my presentation, El Progreso de Periodismo, is The Progress of Journalism. And when I talk about Spanish language news media, um, people often think about uh, elsewhere, right? Mexico or Colombia or another place. And really what I study is Spanish language news media that's created for U.S. residents, people living in the United States. Okay, let's see here. If we can get to that second slide. This is a little bit difficult to see and that's because this newspaper is actually 200 years old. Um, <laughs> this is El Mississippi. El Mississippi is um, recognized, uh, not definitively proven to be, but recognized as the first Spanish language newspaper to be published in the United States. It celebrated its 200th birthday in September 2008. So that gives you an idea about how long uh, the Spanish language news media has been around. And of course, this predates any era of broadcasting. So when we're talking about news media here, we're talking specifically about print, print media. Um, this was just four pages long. Uh, they're pretty dense pages, as you can see. And it was published in both English and Spanish. So it was not written just in Spanish, which is something we're seeing today. There's a really healthy mix of newspapers that are written in both English and Spanish, as well as those that are Spanish only. Um, the mission of El Mississippi, which was started in New Orleans, was to encourage um, Latin American countries in their independence away from Spain to encourage these movements. So it was very much politically oriented. Um, it was not, it had no, um, veneer of objectivity, nor did any other general market newspapers that were published at that time. At that time, the, the media in the U.S. was an advocate press, and so this would be in line with what we were seeing uh, in its English language counterparts. So today, uh, we have more than 400 daily, weekly, and monthly newspapers in the United States that are written in Spanish. And some of you would be surprised that some of them are in places where we don't typically see a large, uh, they have not had traditionally large Spanish-speaking populations. Many cities in the south, um, North Dakota, right? Places where you don't think of tradi traditionally established Spanish-speaking populations. Of course, California, Texas, Arizona, places that used to be Mexico, um, have well-established Spanish-speaking populations and have had for a very long time. If we look closer to us in Seattle and Washington State, what we're seeing now is we have traditionally had well-established Spanish-speaking populations in the agricultural areas, eastern Washington, Yakima, um, I want to say is around 50% Spanish-speaking. Um, and now we are seeing those Spanish speakers migrating to more urban areas west of the mountains. And as that happens, we're starting to see more Spanish language news media emerging in places like Ferndale, uh, where there is a brand new Spanish language weekly newspaper. In Seattle, where there is finally one 24-hour uh, Spanish language radio station, even though the population of Spanish speakers is only about 5%. So we're seeing this, um, this really strong growth in newspapers, particularly weekly newspapers. Radio stations have exploded 1,000% growth um, in about 20 years, which is, is really huge, uh, more than 800 Spanish language radio stations. There are four major uh, broadcast networks, and those are, would be television broadcast networks, and more than 80 cable networks. Now, those are primarily entertainment oriented, and I don't really study those. I really stick specifically to news media. What else is fascinating is that all of this explosion in Spanish language news media growth is occurring in an atmosphere of news media decline for general market um, newspapers, magazines, and broadcast outlets. This is the number of U.S. daily newspapers, and you can see, uh, you can see where it's trending. 
and uh, between 1990 and 2005. If I was able to put up 2008, you'd see an even sharper, steeper slope going down. I read a statistic yesterday that said one in five journalists who was employed in a newsroom in the year 2000 is now no longer employed in a newsroom, and that's in general market um, newspapers. Now, here, in contrast, are ad revenues. This is the net income of Univision. You can see trending the exact opposite way. Um, and Hispanic newspaper ad revenue. Any of you who are familiar with newspapers know uh, that they get their, you know, ad revenues are the bread and butter. Without ad, ad revenue, you cease to exist. And we can see this tremendous growth in ad revenues um, between 1970 and 2005. I will tell you that most of the growth in this ad revenue uh, across all medium is um, that advertisers desire to reach what's been known as the Latin pot of gold, right? They want to reach Spanish speakers who are accessing these uh, radio stations, newspapers, magazines, and they want to reach those, those, that audience to sell their papers. And this is very much a targeted marketing effort, and they've found success with it, obviously, or they wouldn't be doing it. So um, while I study the growth of news media as a tool for democracy building and something that is good for our community and our society, from an advertising perspective, uh, it is quite lucrative, quite, quite lucrative. Um, a lot of people have attributed this growth in Spanish language news media to when it came on their radar screen, which is unfortunate. But as human beings, we're all limited by our own experiences. And uh, journalists and reporters are no different. So some of you may remember in the spring of 2006, there were massive immigration marches on May 1st. Uh, a, a day without immigrants, or they called it the Great American Boycott. Um, it, was, it was a really big deal in the news, and many commentators started talking about awakening the sleeping giant, and all of a sudden they discovered there was this thing called Spanish language news media, um, which in fact has a rich 200-year tradition. And the reason I use these specific uh, numbers is to show you that that tradition was healthy and growing well before 2006. Um, so while it became kind of a topic of conversation from general market news outlets in 2006, really the Spanish language news media has been quite strong for a very long time and continues to grow at a time when general market news media is really experiencing one of the worst declines in its history. Um, I should say also that the marches themselves were unprecedented. Um, some people who study civil rights called them the biggest civil rights um, issues since the 1960s, these marches. I mean, they were very newsworthy in and of themselves. But the marches were organized primarily by word of mouth and by Spanish language news media outlets organizing people who were going to march. So they did play a significant role in those marches. So kind of common myth, I think, is that people think Spanish language news media is growing because the Spanish-speaking population is growing. Well, that's true. The Spanish-speaking population is growing. Um, this is the, um, I'm sorry, the march uh, in Los Angeles in, um, on May 1st, 2006. This is a picture. It's a little difficult to see, but these are millions of people participating in um, a peaceful march. And this is a photograph that ran in La Opinion, which is the largest daily Spanish language newspaper in the country and the one that serves Los Angeles. Um, this prompted uh, the Pew Hispanic Center to do a report called The Giant Hidden in Plain Sight. When these marches happened and everybody started talking about, you know, where, where did all this come from? We're so shocked. We can't believe it. Um, this this uh, r report, which was aptly titled The Giant in Plain Sight, came out. And I apologize, it's a little bit difficult to read, but I think it does speak to this, the importance and the strength of Spanish language news media. The first question is, which media do various ethnic groups rely on more heavily for information on their native lands and on their communities? And this first group here is labeled Hispanics. And you can see that it's more than 80% um, reliance on ethnic media as a trustworthy source of news. Um, and oftentimes, uh, as the only source of news for what's going on in communities that are traditionally undercovered and underrepresented by the general market news media. The second question is, what media do various ethnic groups rely on more heavily for news on politics and government? 
And you'll see an even more dramatic difference here. Um, Hispanics or Latinos compared to other groups, um, their reliance for news on politics and government, and that's US politics and government, not patria or homeland um, politics and government. So um, you can see there's a tremendous trust factor that's shown here um, in the trust they put in ethnic media versus what Cyril calls mainstream media, but I refer to as general market media. So uh, as I mentioned, there is this, what I think is a, a bit of a myth that the growth in Spanish language news media is driven by the growth in the Spanish speaking population. Remember, please, this is really important, that Hispanic does not mean Spanish speaking, right? Many, many people are identifying themselves as Hispanic who do not speak Spanish as their first language. Um, and you can see in this 2007 statistic that in fact, most of the population that identifies as Hispanic in the United States is in fact native born rather than foreign born. And that's a real switch from what it was in 1980. So I think there is this common misconception, this, and this map shows Spanish speaking. So this shows Hispanic identified, people who identify themselves as Hispanic uh, to the US Census. And this shows people who are actually Spanish speaking. And um, really the areas that are fastest growing in terms of the number of Spanish speakers are here around Atlanta and Chicago and over here kind of in the Midwest. Uh, and those are where we're seeing more and more um, news outlets emerging to serve those populations. But again, I want to just make sure that it's clear that because you identify as Hispanic does not mean you are Spanish speaking. And because you are Spanish speaking does not mean you can't read in English. In fact, what we know is that about 50% of newspaper readers who consume, primarily consume their news from a Spanish language newspaper are fluent in English. And so they're not turning to Spanish language newspapers because they can't have another source. It's they have a choice, right? They are also consuming news. They're consuming news in both English and Spanish. But for the most part, they're relying on Spanish language news, which speaks to the credibility and trust factor that we were looking at, uh, that we were looking at before. So um, this same Pew Hispanic Trust um, report from 2004, this is a quote from the report. It says, regardless of nativity, education, income, or language preferences, an overwhelming majority of Latinos, 78%, believe that the Spanish language news media are very important to the economic and political development of the Hispanic population. Further, nearly half believe that the English language media contribute to a negative image of the Hispanic population among English speaking Americans. This concern is highest among those Latinos who have the greatest exposure to these media, right? So the uh, people who identify themselves as Hispanic and read more and more English language media feel even more strongly that it portrays Latinos negatively. Um, so we're really starting to begin to identify this split between the ethnic media and the general market media. I want to talk for a minute about the functions of the Spanish language media and why people would turn to Spanish language media. There are several that have been identified. Um, one, the Spanish language uh, news media tends to give more news from various homelands. For example, if you're in Los Angeles, you're primarily going to get news uh, from Mexico. If you are in Florida, you're primarily going to get news from Puerto Rico and Cuba. What the general market news media tends to do is sort of focus on what's known as the pan latinidad, right? Like anybody who speaks Spanish, you have the same culture, right? And sort of makes this mishmash uh, that's really not an accurate reflection of very rich and diverse cultures. So uh, the Spanish language news media is providing more international coverage to its particular audience that is, you know, whatever the, the greatest audience is in its service area. Um, Almost all Spanish language media, news media outlets have a specific section um, dedicated to immigration news. It's a huge topic. Um, you'll see coverage of immigration issues kind of as a blip on the monitor when there are big marches or large events. You'll see that in the general market newspaper, but in the Spanish language newspaper, it's every day. Every day there's a section on immigration and there are stories about immigration. 
Um, another really important function of Spanish language news media, and this is particularly true of broadcast media, is its emergency function. And that's one that's sometimes overlooked. Um, this came to my attention in 2006 when there were massive flash, flash floods in southwest Texas. And the television and the radio were coming through with emergency broadcast signals, evacuate, evacuate, evacuate. Um, and they were only in English. And so people who did not speak English had no access to that emergency broadcast information to keep them safe. So there's also a safety function um, of the Spanish language media. Kind of closer to home and more personal reasons why people might turn to a Spanish language newspaper is that it reflects people they know, communities they know, um, things that they care about. Might quote a store owner that you know, might talk about your son's soccer team. Um, it, it reflects you. It's the same reason anyone reads any newspaper. You want to see yourself reflected in your newspaper. And many, many people uh, who live in Latino communities are not seeing their Latino communities reflected in those general market newspapers. And I think that's a really big lesson that the general market newspapers could and should be learning um, from their ethnic media counterparts. Further, um, Spanish language media is going to provide it, more information in Spanish on how to vote, right? Where to get your flu shot, um, where to take your kid to preschool, things that you may not know. If you're migrating from Yakima to Seattle, you're coming from a place where your child's teacher probably speaks Spanish, your doctor probably speaks Spanish, your grocery store clerk probably speaks Spanish, um, you know, your principal at the school probably speaks Spanish, and you're coming to Seattle where 5% of people speak Spanish. Now, how are you going to figure out if you have, if you are not speaking English, how are you going to figure out where to do all these things that are really important and essential to your everyday life? The ethnic media really fulfills that function for people. Um, and this is especially important in areas that, are, that do not have traditionally large Spanish-speaking populations. I mentioned a little bit earlier, Seattle has a radio station called Radio Sol. And for a very long time, Radio Sol was one of the few um, stations in the nation that broadcast 24 hours in Spanish with local homegrown news. Uh, and I did a case study on it as part of my research. Unfortunately, a year after I did that, uh, it, was, it was bought up by a corporate interest, and it now hubs its news in Oneo, Texas, like everybody else. So now, if you live in Seattle and you rely on the radio to get your news in Spanish, um, you're going to be getting not news from Seattle, but news from San Antonio, Texas. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that later. Finally, the reason uh, that people are turning towards Spanish language news media rather than a general market newspaper um, is that the news is simply covered differently. And I'm going to show you some examples of that from some stories I've done. Traditionally speaking, the ethnic media, uh, which exists all over the place, I mean, there are just a tremendous amount of ethnic media outlets in the United States, things you might not even think of. In Chicago, for example, there's a newspaper, a daily newspaper in Polish because they have such a large Polish-speaking population, right? Um, traditionally, the role of the ethnic media has been to assimilate people, right? To Americanize you, to uh, bring you in, and now you know, you're supposed to check your culture at the door, and you're, you're going to melt into the pot. Well, we're seeing that paradigm shifting a bit. With the strength of the Spanish language media, this is particularly true. And the function becomes more of acculturation, where people are, are really celebrating two or more cultures. They are not abandoning their culture or checking it out the door um, to be something else. And um, part of this is preserving language, um, looking at photos of people who look like you in your daily newspaper always having that connection um, to important holidays that may be celebrated and to key issues that are going on in your homeland. So um, what we're seeing is a whole shift in the ethnic media, but really the Spanish language media, because it's so strong and so viable and so growing so rapidly right now, is leading the charge to kind of embracing this model of um, acculturation versus assimilation. So it's always important to get down to the brass tacks. It's, it's wonderful to talk about lofty and philosophical ideas, but really somebody's got to pay the bills, right? 
And that's true for, for journalism as it is for anything else. Oh, I'm sorry, before I go there, here is a, um, these are, I think, really stark examples. This is the front page of the LA Times um, on the day of the May 1st, 2006 marches. And this is the front page of La Opinion. Um, the photo photograph I showed you in the beginning with all the people around the corner, that's below the fold, so you would be able to see it. But what you see here is a lot of people marching peacefully, and what you see here are some people who look really threatening and are holding the American flag upside down. So um, studies have shown us that in terms of newspaper content, 75% of what we take in is visual. So um, we're taking in quite different um, impressions and cognitive, cognitively processing them very differently from these two photos. Um, I think this is a pretty stark example of why some people may be turning to this option. So there are different types of ownership models and it's important to talk about this because it really and truly affects how the news is going to be delivered. The most rare is, is the most kind of romantic uh, local independence newspaper that's in Spanish and it's started by people who really have this burning desire to um, serve their community and the reason it's small and rare is because it's hard to get Macy's to advertise with you. Right? So um, there are two sort of recent examples of, uh, of papers that are making it. One's in San Jose and one's in New York City. The one in New York City is started by two people who left a Spanish language newspaper chain to form an independent paper and, and they're still making a go of it last time I checked. So that's kind of the most independent, altruistic, but also the most rare uh, model. Um, probably the most common model that we're seeing right now is a local Spanish language paper that's a sister paper to a general market paper, right? I'm the Dallas Morning News, but I see that Latin pot of gold over there, so I'm going to come up with a Spanish language version and it's going to sell like hotcakes and that's what happens. So we see that in big cities. Um, Miami El Nuevo Herald is owned by the Miami Herald. It has a separate newsroom but it's in the same building. So those are sister papers and that's an example of what's also going on here in Ferndale. Um, another example is a regional Spanish language sister paper. <clears throat> if any of you have ever picked up, you can pick up for free um, a local paper called La Raza which is actually done at the Everett Herald, but it circulates all the way from Olympia to Bellingham. So that's why it's kind of a regional model. It's not local Bellingham news. It's not necessarily local Everett news. It's kind of Pacific Northwest news. And it's produced by the Everett Herald, which is owned by the Washington Post Group. Um, OI in Chicago and LA are kind of, um, well, they're owned, OI used to be owned by the Chicago Tribune. And, what happened is now Chicago and LA kind of trade content. Oh, you're covering that concert? Okay, I'll trade you that. And then we don't have to pay so many reporters, right? You can scrimp a little bit there. So the regional, uh, the regional ones are really um, an effort to get at that Latin pot of gold without spending too much money or too much resources or too much time um, trying to actually gather the news. Um, another model is the Spanish language newspaper chain. Empromedia is really powerful and it is not very old. It was formed about 10 years ago when uh, El Diario La Prensa, which is the, the oldest newspaper in this daily Spanish newspaper in the States, and La Opinion, which is the largest circulation da daily Spanish paper in the United States, um, combined. And they own about 12 newspapers. Um, and they are, very, uh, they are very powerful. They are on the ground. They are covering their communities. They are also trading a little bit of content back and forth. So you can see there are a lot of different models and kind of they all have costs and benefits associated with them. For example, the paper in Ferndale doesn't report news in Spanish, it reports news in English and translates it into Spanish. So imagine the impact that has when you're going into a community trying to earn trust, trying to make connections as a reporter, trying to really get to know that community. But if you're not speaking to people, in their native tongue, or if you're eliminating some people you can talk to because you can't speak their language, your coverage is probably not going to penetrate as deeply or buy you as much loyalty with your audience. Um, in terms of broadcast outlets, this is something that really um, 
I personally find very troubling. Um, because of the 19, 1996 FCC relaxation on ownership rules, there has been tremendous consolidation of uh, ethnic media broadcast outlets um, to the point where um, pretty much Telemundo, which is really NBC, and Univision, which is really owned by some people in Texas, um, <laughs> controls just about everything. I mean, they, they make Clear Channel look diverse. They, they really control everything. And then again, what we're seeing is that news is hubbed out. If I live in Oakland, my news comes from Dallas. It just, it, it doesn't serve your local population. In fact, it got so bad uh, that Univision in 2006 was fined the highest fine the FCC had ever given, $24 million, uh, because it didn't provide the requisite one hour a week of children's programming and instead showed telenovelas or soap operas. <laughs> and said that that qualified as educational programming for children. And nobody was monitoring to see what was going on. Now, telenovelas are very, 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 very cheap to produce. They are the cheapest thing you can possibly put on TV. And so if I'm Univision and I own all the TV stations, and I say I'm going to put the cheapest thing on every single one of these TV stations, I have my eye on the bottom line, not my eye on serving my community, especially children with educational programming. So um, I'm going to get to this in a minute. But uh, so what's important to recognize about that broadcast piece as well is that radio is the primary um, medium of information, news and information for people who speak Spanish. And there's several reasons for that that have been cited. Um, it's really prevalent, right? You can get it just about everywhere. You don't have to seek it out. You don't have to subscribe to it. Uh, you can listen to radio while you're doing other things, while you're working, while you're, you know, in the home. Um, and also, Latin American countries have a very, very, very strong radio tradition. Um, if you see, for example, a, there's a coup in Mexico, the first thing that happens is the radio lines get cut, right? Because people have used uh, radio as a medium for political organization in Latin America for a very, very long time. And so people are used to turning to the radio for that news. If you think about it from a practical sense, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, you're not going to have a newspaper truck driving up some winding road, but you can send a radio signal there pretty easily, right? So there is that um, kind of cultural adherence to radio and that reliance on radio. When you see um, a conglomerate buying up every single radio station, um, it's concerning. And then when the FCC, then it, as it did in 1996, removed any requirement for news, uh, for stations to provide news and information, what you have now is most Spanish-speaking, uh, Spanish-language radio stations are providing shock jock type stuff and music. And that's it. So if I have moved from Yakima to Seattle, what am I going to get? I'm going to get a wide variety of lovely different regional music choices. And I'm going to get a Spanish language version of Howard Stern that I probably don't want my kids to listen to. And I'm not going to get anything else. I'm not going to know that there is a primary election. I'm not going to know where to vote. I'm not going to know where to get my flu shot. I'm not going to know, you know where to register my kids for preschool. Because the FCC no longer requires that the airwaves be used for the benefit of the public good in the same way that it did prior to 1996. And ethnic media has been hit particularly hard here, um, and particularly in radio, which is, as I mentioned, is the primary medium um, to get news in Spanish-speaking communities. And really, at this point, there's no news. There's no news happening. So um, I should mention also that there are some Spanish-language magazines, many of them, and they're doing quite well. They're mostly. Um, very targeted and kind of entertainment oriented. ESPN Deportes, uh, People in Español, um, a lot of fashion magazines that are in Spanish. Um, so there are, there's a huge wealth of those kinds of magazines and they're quite healthy. Uh, but they, I don't really look at those because they're not really newsy and they're not really uh, a mechanism for building community or democracy, which is what, which is what I study. Uh, so who works at these outlets? I think that's important to look at as well. Um, you may uh, find it surprising to know that more than 92% of the journalists who work at Spanish language news outlets are from elsewhere. They are not from 
uh, the United States, they did not go to college here, they were not trained here. That does not mean they're bad journalists, uh, but certainly every country has its own press traditions in terms of law and ethics. And um, even if you were, if I was to go, I have had a long career in journalism, but if I was to go work in England, I would be a fish out of water. It's my same language, but I don't know British press law or British press, press ethics. It's completely different culture. And that's what we're seeing here as well. Um, so uh, while this growth is, is huge in Spanish language media, primarily the journalists who are serving this need are coming from Central and South America. And they're coming in without a real understanding of US press tradition. So they're kind of behind the eight ball a little bit when they're trying to, uh, trying to get their stories out. Now that's not to say that the quality of the newspapers in any other country is, is worse than it is here because in fact if you go to Mexico you'll find that the quality of the newspapers in Mexico really far exceeds the quality of the newspapers in the United States in terms of um, internet tech savviness, graphic design, um, even the quality of the paper is better. Um, and so it's not to say that anybody has a lesser tradition, it's just that they have a much different tradition. And um, as a result, there is quite a high degree of burnout among these journalists who are coming in to this. You know, um, They have cited in studies that they really are doing this because they want to make a difference in the world, but they're underpaid, they have no health insurance, and they're getting burned out because they haven't had training in US uh, press tradition, uh, including law and ethics. So I've kind of tried to look at what I think um, general market news media could learn from what's going on uh, in the Spanish language press. And uh, I studied particularly newspaper because that's what I did when I was a journalist. And it's my first love. And it's also a lot easier to study because it's words on a printed page. Um, without going overboard into uh, communication theory, um, I'll explain briefly what I looked at. I decided to take um, the largest Spanish language newspaper serving the largest Latino population in the US, which is La Opinión, um, and compare it to the Los Angeles Times. They cover the same population. Um, and look at how they covered a key issue, which is immigration. Now, a lot of communication scholars do what they call framing theory. And to simply explain that, if you have, say, a story about politics, is it covered as an issue frame or a horse race frame, right? Those are examples of frames. A frame is kind of how you cover a story, right? So I developed these eight frames for immigration. Um, one was a legislative frame, a fear frame, an event frame, featured pretty prominently, right? That's the big marches, so we can kind of expect that a hardship frame, a benefit frame, an explanatory frame, which was looking at this um, idea of immigration, um, an economic impact frame, and a burden frame. And then other was just kind of random like entertainment stories that popped out. What's interesting to me, and I realize this is kind of academic-y stuff, but <coughs> what's interesting to me is that we see that the LA Times and La Opinion are covering stories kind of in the same topic areas, right? Both of them, most of their coverage is devoted to legislative issues surrounding immigration. Both of them, the second uh, most prominent thing is coverage is fear about immigration. Both of them um, have strong percentage of coverage regarding events. That's really interesting. So a lot of communication scholars would stop there and their conclusion would be, Wow, look, the LA Times covers things just the same way that La Opinion covers things. Their framing is just the same. And so when I found this, I said, well, there is something wrong with that, because that, that just can't be right. So I looked at uh, what's called the second level of agenda setting. Agenda setting means um, if it's in the newspaper, it's on your mind, right? If I tell you immigration's important because it's on the front page of the paper, you're going to think then that immigration's important. The second level of agenda setting tells us not what to think about, but how to think about it. And if you look at that, you'll see some real differences in coverage. So what that means is when the Los Angeles Times did a legislative story, that story was about border fortification. And while, when La Opinion did a legislative story, it was about immigrant contributions to the economy. 
or about the international impacts that this legislation could have. So both newspapers covered a lot, you know, the predominant frame there is legislation, but what that meant in the papers was something very different. Um, if you look at fear, the fear frame, the Los Angeles Times, a fear story was about the wall, remember that, the big, huge wall, border fortification. And in La Opinion, a fear story was about fear of this federal legislation that would have made it a felony offense to be in this country without proper documentation. So you can see that when you look at this deeper level of what that frame means, you're going to find that the stories are covered very differently. I also looked at many other things in this study. For example, what people are called is always very important, right? Terminology. In the Los Angeles Times, overwhelmingly, the terminology was illegal immigrant. Or sometimes, if it was within quotes, it was just illegals. Um, the term illegals never appeared in La Opinion, and uh, the, prim the prominent term in La Opinion was undocumented workers. So we can see that those are very different types of terms that are going to have very different meaning um, to the audiences that are consuming them. I will tell you there's an alarming number of studies out there that will tell you that the LA Times and La Opinion cover things in the same way. And it's, it, it's a little scary to me because when you really get deep into the issues and you look at the things that are going to affect people's cognitive choices and, and perceptions, they're very different. The Los Angeles Times coverage is going to foment fear and otherness. And the La Opinion coverage looks at as a political movement, right? And, and Los Angeles Times coverage is kind of flash in the pan, people here today, gone tomorrow. La Opinion is, wow, we're on this rising tide. It's very, very, very different. They can both be covering the same march, but the story is going to convey something very different. And I think you know, this does a lot to explain why Spanish speakers and, and, and Latinos who are not Spanish speakers are very loyal to their Spanish language media because it's reflecting their values and things that are, are covered in this way. Too often it's written off as a language issue Right? There's tons more Hispanics now, so of course there's more Spanish language newspapers. It's not really a language issue. It's a content issue. It's a coverage issue. Um, I want to show this video. It's about five minutes um, of Monica Lozano. And she, um, you may have heard of her before. She's, uh, she's an advisor to uh, President Obama. She's the president and CEO of La Opinion. Her grandfather founded La Opinion in 1926. Um, she's worked for the Disney Corporation. I mean, she's, she's really a very famous person. Um, and one of the things that she is most, oh boy, I knew this might happen. <laughs> one of the things she is most uh, vocal about is explaining why and how uh, the ethnic media covers things differently. I actually want this on YouTube. Oh boy, I don't want that. I want the video one. Let's see. YouTuber, I don't think that's going to get it. There we go. Um, this is an event that happened at USC Annenberg. And it features a panel discussion. We're going to go right here to minute 44, <sighs> hopefully, at some point. Uh, it features a, a panel discussion where she explains. Too far, too far. I know it doesn't like me now. Uh, she explains why. She feels the Spanish language media is still so healthy. Okay, take it away, Monica. <gasps> if you keep that at the middle of what you do, and, and you organize around their needs, and you try to understand what do immigrant communities living in Los Angeles need today from their information sources, and you do it with respect, and you tell the stories that both chronicle but also provide information that, that can be of service to them, um, you can not only survive, but you can thrive. Because people recognize um, that that relationship that, we, you, that you have with them is, um, is the most valuable relationship. And very often, and I'll, I'll stop here, but very often, 
the advertiser in front of the relationship with the consumer. And you're doing things because you're trying to satisfy the commercial needs of the organization over the needs of who your audience that you're serving is. And I say if you flip that around and you stay close to your reader and you stay close to your audience and you understand you know, what is it that's important from a core value point of view, um, the rest of it will come. Because you know that relationship um, is, is what's the most important thing when you talk about information and democracy and civic engagement and people connecting to their media um, sources. People need to feel like you care about them. And that's what they're looking for in their, in their news outlets. Um, are you relevant? Do you understand me? Do I, do I talk about things that are important to you? Um, and, and I think that you know, clearly today, eight years later, and we're doing it across different platforms, and we Twitter, and we you know, blog, and we've got all the new technologies. Um, but it's about that, that, that craft and the commitment to that mission that I think is really what um, has been, not just for La Opinion, but for much of Spanish language media across the United States, um, the dedication to serve a community and to use our capacity to deliver information that's practical, useful, relevant, um, of service, is, is really <coughs> the heart of, of this boom in Spanish language media today. Well, there's a growing population, so there's a larger potential audience there. But beyond Spanish and the general things you talk about, what is the, what is the connect? How, what is the story that you cover? How does that look different than a story that an English language newspaper may cover, other than your story is going to be in Spanish and your story is in English? Is there a different angle or perspective or needs that you need to have? Yeah, so um, two things. We, you know, we're very clear about who our audience is. And so we try to make sure that we're selecting stories that are relevant to that audience. Um, but we also want to make sure that we're telling the, the full story of Latinos um, in the United States. And, and very often, um, that point of view is not captured in, in other media outlets. So you can send reporters to cover City Hall or you know the mayor or the school board and you're looking for an angle that both picks up um, issues of importance to that community and connects them to the interest of your readers. Um, so, you know, we very often look, maybe covering the exact same thing, but do it from two distinct points of view. Um, because you're looking for the angle of, of what's relevant to your community. So we were just talking the other day, um, earlier today, excuse me, about um, education. And you know, when you are targeting, for example, a, an immigrant community where the parents may find themselves in an environment where they want to do the very best for their kids and they want to make sure they get into schools like USC, but don't necessarily understand the system and the process that gets you there. So not only are we going to go out and cover LA Unified and the problems of school construction and the problems of you know, educating English language learners, but if we can also provide information that is useful, that says, you know what, your kids should be reading at this level in third grade and be taking these classes to make sure that they get into you know, a track that allows them to be eligible for, and, and that explanatory role, what some people call public service journalism, that permeates everything we do. It's taking something that's complex and perhaps foreign to your readers <coughs> and, and being able to, to so that, in fact, the information is an empowerment tool. The, informa the information actually allows what I very often call is closing the information gap. You know, when you've got a, a community that said, you know, I came here, I want to work hard, I you know, want to start my own business, I want to get my kids into college, I want to make sure. And the one thing that keeps them from being here and going there is, is the lack of information and knowledge. And if we can break that apart and use our capacity to deliver information, that is empowering, um, then we're doing a great job. And I. Okay. I want to leave some time for some questions, and I hope you have some. Anybody? Yes. Uh, last week I saw an article that showed 
the mainstream print media and uh, everybody but Wall Street Journal is on the downward trend. Um, I have to think that the people who are running these papers are not dummies. Why aren't they uh, more focused on providing the service that uh, the local community would like to have? Well, um, a lot of the reason those newspapers are tanking is because the economy is tanking. So Ford is tanking. It's not going to buy a full page ad in your Sunday edition. Then that affects your bottom line. Uh, I, I think it's more than just the economy. It's it, is, it is more than the economy, but the reason we're seeing such a sudden shift has mostly to do with ad revenues. Uh, yeah, but you, you said that the Spanish language papers, mm -hmm. their ad revenues are going up. They are going up. Okay, well, why aren't the mainstream media looking at this? Oh, there's a great business opportunity. Why can't we take advantage of Well, that's the million dollar question right there. So and some of them are. Are, are they dummies? Um, no, but they are not always as reactive as they should be to trends. So if you look, um, a, lot of, a lot of these newspapers are starting up a sister paper in Spanish. And I'd love to say they're starting up a sister paper in Spanish because they really want to serve Spanish-speaking readers. But the reality is usually that they're starting a sister paper in Spanish because they want to attract advertisers who want to get at the readers who speak Spanish. Uh, and It's you know it's I can't give you a definitive answer yeah, as to why are, newspapers are, are tanking. Sister papers are they are they doing well? Focused like the regular Spanish language papers are to provide the types of coverage with the uh, types of reporters in that, or is it sort of a uh, uh, regurgitated mainstream? Some of them are and some of them aren't. Some papers are sent to Guatemala for translation overnight. English, you know, I'm going to cover Billy's Little League and the Mayor's City Hall announcement, send it to Guatemala overnight, they're going to translate it into Spanish and send it back. Those newspapers are not as successful because they, are not, they don't have separate reporting staffs who speak Spanish, who are covering community issues that people care about, but they still bring in a few ad bucks, right? So there's always this balance of kind of quality and I mean the Miami Herald is a great example because it just went through a huge uh, issue. Miami Herald has El Nuevo Herald, obviously a very large Spanish-speaking community, um, long-time, well-established business owners, right, um, who are going to advertise um, and be loyal to that Spanish-language newspaper. It has its own separate newspaper, I mean newsroom, it has its own separate reporting staff, but when times got tough for the Miami Herald, what did it do? Well, it went over to the Spanish language sister paper and pulled out so many reporters that the editor resigned in protest. And what's it doing now? Well, it's putting a lot more of its English language product, just translated into Spanish and putting it in El Nuevo Herald as an effort to save money. And what's that going to do to readership? I don't know. I hope that answered your question. Not really. Okay. But, uh, Do you want me to try again? No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it seems to me that they're dummies uh, running the That's one theory. The sure. <laughs> well, there, there certainly are some in every barrel, right? <laughs> well, the, this decline has not been just a recent phenomenon. It's been going on for you know, quite some time. And you'd think that they would be looking out at, okay, who's successful on this? What can we do to really emulate and steal what they're doing and switch it over here? Yeah. If they're not doing it, something's wrong. Yeah. You had a question? Um, I just had an information question about the local El uh, Periodico. Mm -hmm. Is uh, and you said that's a sister paper. It so I'm just sort of wondering what, what is if, if you should share a little bit more information mm -hmm. about it. What's this sister paper? Yes. How the many, no, so yeah, it's um, 
I know a little bit about it. I haven't visited out there. So the Ferndale Record Journal is the newspaper out there, and it's a weekly newspaper. It serves the community of Ferndale. El, uh, El Periodico uh, comes out once a week also, and in fact, its editor is Ryan Wynn, who is a Western grad, who is a, one of my very best students. Um, and, um, and a couple of their reporters are also former uh, Western journalism students. I'm not sure exactly how they, they divvy up things. My understanding is that um, several of the reporters report for both newspapers. Um, I believe that they also have a translator who will go out with a reporter on assignment to actually do the reporting rather than just later putting it in English. They're still pretty new. I mean, they really just emerged this summer. And so they're still kind of you know, finding their feet and how things are going to work for them. Yeah, the immigration attorney. Yeah, mm -hmm. So he has a monthly column. Oh, okay. Uh, and he writes an English and it's produced in what's called the periodical news version and the El Periodico. Right. So are they translating that locally or are they outsourcing? I think they do translate it locally. I'm not 100% sure, but I think they do translate it locally. And we know for generating other local content. They do. And I will say um, their reporters, even if they're not Spanish speaking reporters, have definitely made an effort to go into the Latino community and find stories. I know because they've called me about some things I've been involved in, and they and they really they're not just trying to say, here's the Ferndale news in Spanish. They're saying, you know, what's going on in Ferndale's Latino community? I really want to tap into what's what's shaking here, and I really want to get to know uh, more about you know educational concerns or housing concerns or you know whatever whatever they may be. So I do feel that that paper is making a pretty strong effort to get to know uh, its Latino community. Mm -hmm. Yes? So and as there are more and more college-age students in the Latino community in the state of Washington, what kind of recommendations would you have for Western to have some more, have, to have a pretty prominent presence as a school that everybody wants to talk about? Yeah, wow, that's a great question, Karen. And um, you know, I have a couple of students who are bilingual. Um, who grew up speaking Spanish in the home and um, I have steered them toward uh, opportunities where they can use their wonderful asset of bilingualism um, in both public relations and, and journalism. Um, you know, it, <laughs> the, if somebody's always looking for the soccer stringer, soccer is huge in Spanish language <laughs> newspapers and, uh, and I've sent a couple of my students to go uh, cover soccer matches um, for La Raza and um, uh, El Periodico is also looking for someone who can cover um, sports for them. So um, I think we can um, help make our students aware of those opportunities and um, really, you know, for so long um, bilingualism was not really seen as the asset we now know it to be today and I think we can really um, celebrate that as a, as a very marketable skill um, in terms of providing people with access to those outlets, knowing what those, access, what those outlets are, building relationships with those key players um, who are involved in those communication outlets. Max. Thank you, John. Actually, have you read the Western Crown this morning? Or I think it was last week, related to it. There's a student that is about to sue the university for being required to, uh, I mean, he was applied for a job campus that requires to be bilingual, English and Spanish. He's not, he still applied, obviously he did not get hired, so he prepared to challenge that. Do you know that? <laughs> we, <laughs> we know about it. <laughs> and, uh, that's interesting, I don't know. I don't know about this, uh, I don't think there's a true uh, vocation in this campus for that, for, for maybe demographic reasons. I do see it, you know, changing and growing though. I haven't been here very long, but in the five years that I've been here, I'm getting more and more students who are bilingual and students who grew up speaking English, but who are also getting a double major in Spanish and wanting to do something with international media. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned that a lot of the um, radio, the, the decline in radio news, um, is that different in places like Yakima where there's the large community? Do they have more local Yes news? and no. What they have in Yakima and is really unique um, is they still have some Radio Campesina 
stations, which are kind of low bandwidth stations uh -huh. that were started by uh, Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez when uh, they started the United Farm Workers uh -huh. Union. Um, there are many, many of them in California. Some of them still exist in the Central Valley, and you'll see some of them as well in eastern Washington. Uh -huh. um, and they, those low bandwidth stations such as Radio Campesina are really educationally based. Uh -huh. I mean, there's on the radio, sit your kid in front of the radio for a Spanish lesson. I mean, it's that uh -huh. service oriented. And that is very, very different to the commercial uh, Univision station that's yeah. playing Spanish Howard Stern and Ranchero music yeah. all day long, right? And do they do news as well? Um, Radio Campesina? Yeah. They do a little bit. Now, I will say they are a political tool. So the yeah, news that they're getting is like, join the farm workers union, here's what the meeting is, right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's not real broad spectrum okay. news, but there is some news. There's, some news. There, there's, not really, um, there's not really any pretending that, you know, they're yeah. Cairo radio or something. I mean, they, they are they what they are. They don't say they're fair and balanced. No, they are not. <laughs> <laughs> they're there with a the mission. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh. If those are coming out of Spanish, other Spanish-speaking countries, or if yeah. they're starting to grow like, from the US? That is a great question. Um, and there's actually a lot of research being done right now into uh, internet news. And what we find is that particularly uh, people between the ages of 20 and 40 who are Spanish speakers are online more than anybody else. Like, they are just online like crazy. And, um, and they're on news sites. Um, CNN and Espanol um, all the time. Um, also, I mentioned a, a, that in Mexico the newspapers are very, very tech savvy. If you look at, say, the Mexican version of the Washington Post, which would be El Universal, um, they have an iPhone app and they had it before the Washington Post did. So <laughs> if you're in the US and you want to know what's going on in Mexico City, you can hop on the internet and you'll, I mean, you definitely can get that um, news from your home country. I'm not aware of a study that has looked at whether or not, say, if I'm in San Antonio, I'm getting my news from my local San Antonio paper or from El Universal in Mexico City. I, I, if I was to have a hypothesis, it would probably be a lot of both, because Mexico City is not going to have my local news. But I also want to know what's going on back home and where my family is. Mm -hmm. Do you think there are any circumstances in which the Spanish language media might Anytime Boy, it's hard to say. I mean, it's certainly enjoying. Uh, it's certainly enjoying popularity now, and and that really rapid growth is kind of leveling out. As you know, and who knows if that's the economy or market saturation or anything else. It's really too soon to say. The growth is not continuing this way. It's kind of you know continuing this way. Um, if more local general market newspapers began putting out Spanish language editions, sister papers, um, you might see a decline in something like La Opinion, which is read way outside of LA, even though that's where it's centered, but it's just a very trusted news source. What we know from media research is that readers want local first. They always want local, local, local. The more local it can be, the more I'm going to like it. Um, but there's not a lot of that right now. So um, if we saw more mainstream papers doing local Spanish language coverage or even just better coverage, more inclusive coverage, um, they might be able to steal some of that market share away from the Spanish language media. But that's just my hypothesis. I think we're just about out of okay. time, but we do have one moment for uh, an announcement about the World Issues Forum. Speaking just reminded me tomorrow's World Issues Forum in the Fair Haven Auditorium at noon is by Marjorie Bustish Ariana, who is uh, from the Ed School uh, in UCLA. I think she's the director of the teacher ed program there, and she works, uh, she's giving a talk about uh, bilingual children as cultural brokers. Yeah. Um, so that's at noon, and she's also going to be teaching, I think, in the Global Migration, or talking in the Global Migration Panel, which is going to be open at 8 30 on Friday morning. But noon to 1 20 tomorrow at Fair Haven will be. Bilingual children. What time? Noon. Noon. Okay. Well, we've also had a very good talk today. And oh, I think we thank you. Thank you for coming.